Welcome to episode two of Radio Design 101. Today's episode is going to be on impedance matching. The topic outline includes why use impedance matching networks. We're going to look at the big picture before we jump down into the second topic, which is L-type matching networks for receiver inputs. But the material we're going to cover is quite general. We're also going to be using the Nano VNA to validate our design. And then we'll look at other matching network circuit topologies, things that are used in transmitters as well as receivers and various applications. And we'll take a look at real world applications in the final part of the video. I think this is going to be one of the best parts because we're going to look at actual circuit schematics from a wide range of radios. So like episode one on bandpass filters, this video on impedance matching contains a lot of material. So I've divided it into two separate videos. You're watching the first of those now. And then we'll have a separate video, part two of this episode, that will cover the last two topics. I would encourage you throughout these videos to pause things if you want and study the diagrams in more detail. So why are matching networks important? This is the big picture. We have a transmitter that's putting out a certain amount of power into an antenna. That power is PT. In general, that power may spread out evenly in all directions, growing as a sphere. Over at the receiver side, the signal comes in and competes with interferers, which we can get rid of with filters, but it also competes with noise. Now the equations for the received power and the noise power are down here. Now in order to receive the signal well, we need P sub R, the received power, to be greater than the noise power. For example, 10 to 100 times the noise power level. Exactly how much depends on the modulation type and some other factors. But the point is, the noise sets a lower bound on the amount of signal that we actually have to get into the receiver, and it's based on a power basis. All right, now here is the circuit level view. On the left, we have a receiver connected to, in this case, it's a dipole antenna. And I'll assume it's a resonant dipole antenna so that the impedance looking into that antenna, which is the source impedance when you use it on receive, is our antenna. Now over here on the right is a circuit diagram representing that situation. This is the Thevenin equivalent. It's the source model for the antenna. We have an open circuit voltage and a source impedance called our antenna. That drives into the input impedance of the receiver, Rn. And this, of course, forms a voltage divider. And the equation for the voltage division is here. The power, however, is that quantity Vn squared divided by Rn. Sometimes we care about power in terms of dBm. And here's the formula for that. Now. Maximum power transfer. We want to get as much of that power that got to our receive antenna as possible into the receiver to compete with the inevitable noise power. Let's take an example. Let's assume that the open circuit voltage is 1 microvolt RMS and the antenna impedance is 50 ohms. I know for the dipole it's 73, blah, 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 but 50 is a good number to use for this illustration. Then if we use this voltage divider and the equations we just had, we can calculate what various quantities are for different Rn values. And that's what's done here in this table. So for 10 ohms, we get a lot of voltage division. We get 0.17 microvolts out of that 1 microvolt that we had as open circuit voltage. That 0.17 microvolt squared divided by 10 ohms gives us 2.8 femtowatts. And the uh, dBm value is minus 116. Let's move on to the 50 ohm case. That would be the matched case, Rn is equal to the antenna resistance. And in that case, we get half of the open circuit voltage. That then gives us a power of 5 femtowatts, which is about twice what we had before. If we go up to 1k ohm for the input, then we get more voltage in. But the power is much less than it was with a 50 ohm matched impedance. So the, what we can conclude from this is that the received power is maximized when the input resistance is equal to the antenna resistance. 
Now with that background, let's jump into looking at some actual networks used to do this maximum power transfer thing. My hope is that this will guide you in doing your own designs, but also in understanding schematics of radios when you look at them. And that's where we're headed. The last bullet here is examples in real world applications. So here is a project we do in the course, but the material is general. It applies to lots of radio design situations and will occur again when we look at project three down the line. Project one is the front end section of this super heterodyne receiver design, and it's shown down here in the bottom. We're going to assume that we're going to have a 50 ohm antenna and that the next stage in the block diagram also is 50 ohms. The amplifier shown here is a common base transistor amplifier and it generally has a low input impedance RN and a high output resistance. In both cases we may need matching networks to get the maximum power into the amplifier and get the maximum power from the amplifier into the load. Now here's a review from episode one part two so I'd encourage you to go back and look at that. Moreover, I would encourage you to freeze the frames here and study these diagrams some if you want to learn this material deeply. I'm going to go over this reasonably quickly because we've covered it before. This is the amplifier with the output matching network shown. The details of the output matching network are here. And the way we design and analyze this is we recognize that when viewed from the right hand side, i.e. from the load side, we see a series combination of a capacitor and an inductor. And that creates a series resistance capacitance inductor circuit, which we said in episode one has a Q given by the reactance at the center frequency divided by that resistance RS. Here that equals eight. Now Q is the quality factor and it's related to the amount of loss per cycle that you get when energy is exchanged between these two elements. So it's a feature of this particular set of components in this particular configuration. Now if we view it from the left hand side, which is what the amplifier sees looking out toward the load, we know that the Q is eight and we know that when we look at it from this side, we have a shunt inductor and we have a capacitor that also goes to ground through a small resistance, 50 ohms, small compared to the minus J400. So essentially we have a parallel LC network. The formula for Q there is RP over X naught, where X naught again is the center frequency reactance value. Given that we have a Q of eight for this particular situation, we can then solve for what the RP value is looking into this now parallel RLC circuit. And that works out to be 3.2 K ohms in this particular case, approximately. The more exact formula is down here in the bottom right. This is the one we'll use going forward. This is the one that you may see derived in other videos and textbooks. I took a slightly different approach here in hopes that it would be somewhat more intuitive and less mathematical. But this is the result. The parallel resistance looking in here is equal to the series resistance multiplied by one plus Q squared, or in this case, multiplied by 65. Now let's use that to design a matching network for the input of this particular amplifier. The input has a block shown as matching network and bandpass filter. That bandpass filter was designed in episode one, and it's shown here as the 390 picofarad in parallel with 6.8 nanohenries. At the center frequency, this parallel LC network ideally becomes an open circuit. That's why I've graded out. The matching network is now added to the right of that to convert from 50 ohms down to, in this case, 10 ohms. And you'll note that the matching network looks very similar to the L match that we just looked at. So here's the solution for the matching network components. Again, we're matching from 50 ohms down to 10 ohms. The formulas are given here in the lower left and the lower center. 
we have used those formulas to compute the Q needed for the matching network as 50 ohms, the RP value, divided by the RS value of 10 ohms, minus 1 and the square root of that, which is 2. The XP value, which is the reactance for the inductor in this particular case, is now 50 divided by that Q value, the resistance divided by the Q. That gives us 25 ohms is what we need to implement for this inductor. The series arm is a capacitor in this case. They're always opposite if one's an inductor, the other's a capacitor. It doesn't have to be inductor here and capacitor here. could be the other way around. But in this particular case, this capacitor will double as a DC block that we saw in a previous diagram. So it's better to do it this way in that sense. That series reactance is the resistance value times the Q. Then what we do is we convert to the actual L values at the center frequency, which is assumed to be 100 megahertz in this example. So here are the values, uh, 40 nanohenries and 80 picofarads, which for a actual capacitor, we'd have to use like 82. Okay, so we're going to build this up and look at it. This is from a previous video in the Nano VNA series. So I'd encourage you to look at it. The title is down here in the lower left, measuring S21 and S11 of a small signal amplifier. When we did that, we had the transistor biased at 0.9 milliamps, and that gave an RN value of 50 ohms, so we didn't need matching. So we didn't use a matching network in that particular case. The measured gain, which is S21 with the network analyzer, was 14 dB. Now what we've done is we've increased the bias current from 0.9 milliamps to 4.5 milliamps. We did that by paralleling a resistor. We had a 1K ohm resistor from the emitter to ground, and we've paralleled a 220 ohm resistor with that, and that increases the current to 4.5 milliamps. So that's an increase of about five times. Then we also added the input matching network. That's this inductor and this capacitor, which was a DC block, but then we switched it out to the capacitor value needed for the matching. The measured power gain increased from the previous 14 dB to 22 dB. The measured input impedance is now 54 minus J19, as shown here on the S11 yellow graph. Note that the S21 value shows as 19.6 dB, but it's not on the peak. So I've set the marker on 98, which is the center of the FM broadcast band. So we're slightly off in the center frequency, and we're not perfectly 50 ohms, but that doesn't matter. We still have an excellent return loss. We might still want to do a little tweaking on this, but it's pretty good. Now, in order to get there, we had to build an inductor and measure it and see how well it matched what we were asking for which was a J value of 25 ohms. Our first attempt is shown on the left. We had four turns, and that was J31 ohms. The second attempt dropped that to three turns, and it reads 22 ohms, basically. But this can be squished together a little bit more, and that brings it up, and that's what we did, to about 25 ohms. So things don't always work out to the exact number. That's the thing about RF. There are some subtle parasitics in the components and in the layout that are not accounted for in our analysis, and we usually have to do some tweaking. So that brings us to the end of part one on this video on impedance matching. Please come back and join us for part two, where we're going to look at additional aspects and circuit topologies for impedance matching as well as the real-world applications. We'll take a look at a lot of schematics and try to understand what's going on. Thank you for watching.